Beneath the Spanish moss-draped oaks of New Orleans, whispers of the past echo through the cobblestone streets and along the moonlit levees of the Mississippi. Amidst these murmurs, a tale as old as the city itself persists, moving into the fabric of history and folklore. It begins not with the sound of jazz, nor the revelry of Mardi Gras, but with the soft rustle of silk and the creaking of wooden chests aboard a vessel from France. These chests, no larger than a small suitcase, held more than mere possessions. They held the fate of a colony and genesis of a legend. The casket girls, as history remembers them, were an enigmatic group of young women dispatched by royal decree to resolve a demographic crisis in the 18th century Louisiana. The history of Louisiana is full of ghost stories and haunted locations. One of the most famous is the story of the New Orleans women. In the 1700s, the French territories in Louisiana had a shortage of women. To solve this problem, the French arranged for the transport of appropriate women to be sent over to be married off to local men. However, when some of these women arrived in New Orleans, they were not what they seemed. Some say that these women were actually ghosts, sent to haunt the city. Others say that they were vampires who came to cast spells on the unsuspecting people of New Orleans. Whatever the truth may be, the stories of several women of New Orleans have led to become part of the city's legend and have made it one of the most haunted places in America. They arrived in 1728. The port of New Orleans was a hub of activity, with the discordance of men's voices, the rhythmic pounding of a horse's hooves, and the sound of crates being dragged as ships were emptied of their cargo. A sense of the exotic and mysterious awaited a group of young ladies disembarking from the vessel, La Nouvelle Orléans. As they stepped off the gangway onto the dirt-covered ground, each tightly gripped a small, coffin-like box that contained their worldly possessions. After enduring a grueling six-month journey across the Atlantic, they were anxious to set foot on land. Selected by the Bishop of Quebec by the Order of the King of France, these women of suitable age and social standing had one mission. To find suitable husbands among the settlers of the growing Louisiana colony. But their pale complexions sparked whispers among the local men who saw them as their future wives. Their skin quickly reddened and blistered under the fierce subtropical sun. Known as the Fia La Cassette, because of the distinctive chest they carried, the women were taken to their temporary quarters. They would be looked after by the Ursula nuns until they were married. However, the reality didn't match expectations. The women were met with disapproval from the men of Vir Clare, and many faced unkind marriages or worse, were pushed into prostitution when left without spouses. The French monarch, outraged, ordered their return to France the Ursula nuns moved the chest from the women's possession to the third floor of the convent at 1112 Chartry Street. This floor had always had its windows and doors sealed, and despite the chest being placed there, they were found to be mysteriously empty shortly thereafter. Despite an exhaustive search, the items were never found. Fearful rumors circulated that the women might have been hiding a dark secret, possibly even that they were vampires. In response, the nuns fortified the third floor space with locked doors and windows, the nails of which were even blessed by the Pope. Whispers among the townsfolk took a new turn, 
now with a chilling addition to the tell. In 1978, two individuals with an interest in the paranormal set up camp directly in front of the old Ursuline convent at 1112 Chartree Street to investigate whether the Fiala Cassette were actually vampires. They had been previously asked to leave the property for loitering, but decided to stay the night and observe if anything unusual happened outside the walls. As the hours passed, time seemed to slow down and they eventually fell asleep. Unbeknownst to them, the shutters on the third floor, which had been secured with plasnels, opened and closed repeatedly. The recording cameras ceased operating as the scene faded to black. The following morning, the investigators' lifeless bodies were discovered. They had been brutally mutilated, appearing as if they had been attacked by some kind of animal, and their bodies were devoid of blood. The connection between vampires and the Fiala Cassette had become chillingly apparent. The tale of the casket girls as vampiric beings who drain blood has been part of folklore since the early 20th century. Tourists gather, led by guides, across from the Beauregard Keys House Museum, eager to catch a glimpse over the walls of the old Ursuline convent. Guides dramatically point to the third floor where shutters remain closed, and spin a yarn about how these French girls are contained by Pope Bless Nels, preventing them from hunting for human blood on the streets. But come on, you don't actually believe these outlandish stories, do you? These vampire tales seem like a darkly humorous twist on the stories of Vlad the Impaler, the Romanian ruler who impaled his enemies' heads on stakes as a warning to invaders. Due to a lack of military resources and the need for strategic innovation, the vampire rumors surrounding the so-called casket girls are unfounded, and it's possible that the works of Anne Rice helped to popularize the idea that these young women from France were smuggling vampires to New Orleans in their caskets. The suggestion of prostitution tied to these women is another aspect that warrants a more scrutinized examination. The concept of sending women to aid in the growth of New World colonies wasn't originated by the French crown with the casket girls. The first such endeavor dates back to 1663 in the colony of New France, now Quebec. Facing a shortage of women, Jean Talon, the intendant of New France, reached out to King Louis XIV questioned female immigrants. The king responded by initiating a recruitment process for suitable candidates. These women, who had to be between 12 and 25 years old, and come with a recommendation letter from their local priests, were referred to as the Fia du Roy, or the king's daughters. From 1663 to 1673, over 800 made the journey from France to Canada. However, not all of them successfully settled in Quebec. Some passed away on the way to Montreal, and others reconsidered their choices upon reaching the French ports and returned home. And some were sent back to France for not meeting the expectations associated with being a Fia de Roy. Early on, there were false notions that these women were of low moral standing, with some speculating that they were prostitutes seeking redemption for their sins. Baron Lahontan even described them as having middling virtue. Despite the evidence, the rumors persisted and seemed to influence subsequent initiatives. Another group of young women was dispatched in July of 1704 
this time to their French colony in Biloxi, arriving aboard the Pelican. This was at the request of John Baptiste Lemoyne, sealer Bienvenu, who, like Jean Talon, had written to King Louis XIV. Bienville was in dire need of women for his soldiers and settlers who had taken to seek in companionship among Native American women, as they had no French women to marry. Bienville was keen to address this issue. King Louis XIV of France helped out by sending a group of 23 young unmarried women who were known for being good and hardworking to the early settlers in Quebec. These women were picked because they were seen as pure and had good values, which made them great candidates for marriage back around the year of 1700. A letter believed to be from the French king said he sent 20 girls to marry the settlers in Mobile, a place in North America, to help the colony grow strong. These girls were well-behaved, religious, and knew how to work which would help show the local Native American women some valuable skills. The girls had to have a good reputation to be sent. Thanks to the Bishop of Quebec, John Baptiste de la Croix de Chevriers de saint Valier, these women helped the colony Biloxi do well. Later on, when Bienville was in New Orleans in 1721, he needed more women for the men there to marry. The men had been misbehaving with enslaved women or free women of color, and the men themselves weren't the best bunch. Bienville asked for good, virtuous women again. The King of France agreed, and this time got the women from a place called the Hôpital General de la Sacrature which was a kind of hospital that also served as a house of correction. 88 women arrived near Mobile Bay on January 8th, 1721, and Bienville had to figure out what to do with them. Unfortunately, these women came from a tough background. Many were poor and some were prostitutes, but they were intended to become respectable wives. However, this plan didn't work out as well as the previous ones. These women ended up contributing to the rough and wild atmosphere that was already present in New Orleans. Because of this, when Bienville brought over another group of women in 1728 called the Via La Cassette, which was the casket girls, people might have thought that they were also like the women from before, which wasn't a good thing. Rumors like this had been following every group of women sent to the New World over the past 60 years or so. With the historical facts in mind, now it's time to talk about the paranormal tilt of these young women's stories. Most of the vampire-themed tales centering on the Vila Cassettes focus on two things, the caskets and the convent. Perhaps some of the most interesting stories are those centered around the third floor of the 1751 convent building, which to this day remains a stop on almost every haunted history tour of New Orleans. The legend begins with the casket girl's arrival in the city and how upon seeing the women for the first time, the men that they were meant to marry found them unnaturally pale so much that their skin blistered and reddened beneath the subtropical sunlight within the moments. The fear lived with the Ursuline nuns before their marriages occurred. But King Louis IV's hope was that these young women would be better spouses than the former sex workers and prisoners of France was in vain. Most of the casket girls were placed into unwanted marriages where they were mistreated by their husbands. While those left unwed were forced to find other means of survival, including prostitution. So, hearing of their mistreatment, the king ordered that these young women be sent home to France. In preparation for their departure, the cassettes filled with all the young women's possessions. 
were brought up to a room on the third floor of the Ursuline convent for storage. The third floor had always been sealed off and windows shuttered, so it was quite a shock to the nuns when they later returned to fetch the girls' belongings and the luggage were found empty. Even after a search of the entirety of the third floor, none of the items were recovered. Fearing something supernatural was afoot, the nuns went out of their way to ensure nothing and no one could enter or exit the space again. While some stories say those shutters were nailed down with nails blessed by a pope, Pope John Paul II was the first pontiff to visit New Orleans in 1987. So one might assume that those nails were brought to Rome for blessing and then shipped across the Atlantic. The addition of vampirism to these young women's tale, whether the casket girls themselves were the vampires or their cassettes were their method of carrying vampires across the sea to the new world, is much more recent. What exactly are the casket girls? While the name alone conjures images of the macabre, the fiel of cassette, a.k.a. women with suitcases, traveled to French colonies in America and arrived in the New World with a trunk or cassette containing their belongings. The word cassette morphed into casquette over time, and that translated to casket. History recorded these women as casket girls, the Fiala cassettes, were some of the original mothers of New Orleans. Here's their story. The word casket was not widely used until the mid-19th century to refer to burials or the dead. Cassette is a middle French word that refers to, instead, a small box for jewels or chest. The casket girls were known to have brought cassettes with them, but they literally were meant for storage, luggage. And we can't blame a girl for wanting to bring as much with her when traveling to an unknown location. By 1900, the term casket in relation to a burial object was widespread in North America. In the early 18th century, the cassettes brought with the young women were, and sorry to disappoint, nothing but a chest, unlikely even in the shape of a casket or coffin at all. Caskets conjure up images quite different from a suitcase of dresses and petticoats that these women were known to carry on the long voyage to New Orleans. These suitcases were relatively small so that the women could carry them without assistance. Many of the depictions of original cassettes stretch this concept, literally, so that the suitcases appear to be large enough to carry a body. By the time the storytellers told the tale of these women, their suitcases took on a new perspective. Why did young women bring caskets to the new world? Did their luggage contain more than petticoats? Paranormal fiction writers love old New Orleans as the city's mix of Catholicism and Vodon influenced by African, French, Spanish, British, and Asian cultures create a perfect starting point for writers to tell vampire tales. But before pop culture and legend turned them into vampires, the Fia, like many women of the time, went through a harrowing journey that would land them in the annals of the history of colonial New Orleans and the world of the paranormal. The Ursulines, otherwise known as the Order of St. Ursula, founded a school almost immediately after their arrival in 1727, which many of the casket girls and other women attended until they were married. The city built the Order's first convent in 1734, and that building was replaced by the existing convent in 1751. The old Ursuline convent is the oldest building in the Mississippi Valley. It survived the fire of 1788 because of its distance from the source of the fire, which began closer to Canal Street. 
the city built a convent close to Fort St. Charles on the eastern downriver side of the Vercare. The Order of St. Ursula continues their mission of educating women in New Orleans to this day. While there were more Ursuline staff in elementary schools, such as St. Angela Marici and Metairie, the Order focuses its efforts on their high school campus uptown. The current old Ursuline convent at Chartree Street and Ursuline's Avenue was completed in 1753, 25 years after the first casket girl's arrival, to house the nuns that had been invited from Rouen, France in 1927, and who were in need of a new building. The sisters ran an orphanage, infirmary, and school on the first floor of the building, while living on the second. The French colonial building itself is the oldest structure in New Orleans. Having survived the two devastating fires that struck the French Quarter in 1788 and 1794, the nuns not only cared for the sick and dying during their outbreaks of yellow fever, they also are said to have tended to the wounded of the War of 1812 and the Civil War, which explains the ghost. A postcard from the now-closed Musee County Wax Museum shows an exhibit of the Casca girls arriving in New Orleans and meeting with a nun. It was here, legend says, that the Casket girls found a home in the third floor attic. Their coffin-like wooden boxes containing their possessions stashed at the foot of their beds. At some point, the nuns sealed off the third floor, shuttering the windows ostensibly to protect the virtue of the young women in their care. But then, the hand mirrors that the girls brought with them mysteriously vanished, and neighbors fell ill, and crops felled, and much more. Whispers began that the vampire pill casket girls had brought an evil with them from the old country. Eventually, the nuns had to get everybody out of the third floor and close it up forever. But years later, a guy repairing the leaky roof found the empty caskets, and it all began to make sense in an insane 18th century sort of way. The casket girls had smuggled in vampires from Eastern Europe, vampires who were now leaving blood-drained corpses all over the greater New Orleans metro area. Many believed the flying vampires wanted to return to their caskets on the convent's third floor which is why the windows were permanently sealed with 800 screws made of silver that had been blessed in Rome by the Pope himself. It turns out the windows were sealed not to keep the virtue in, but to keep the evil out. Allegedly, Pope John Paul II even re-blessed the anti-vampire screws during his 1987 visit. And if you look up at the third floor today, you can see that the windows are still shuttered. Now it's said that the third floor is sealed off and motion detectors protect it from anyone who might have a curiosity that might have them trying to go in or open up the third floor. But all the precautions for the knot, with the vampires and their stories were in New Orleans for good as anyone who has ever Googled New Orleans and vampires can tell you. One story holds that in the 1970s, a couple of ghost hunters ditched a tour of the convent and hid out in the courtyard with the intention of spending the night monitoring the sealed third floor windows for vampiric shenanigans. Alas, their corpses drained of blood were discovered the following morning. Why they needed to trespass for this investigation when they could have set up folding chairs on the public sidewalk on the Chartree Street with a clear view of the shuttered windows is not known. But the casket girls and their contraband bloodsuckers aren't the only macabre legends tied to the old Ursuline convent. Ghost hunters report that the apparitions of the nuns and their dark habit can be seen navigating the original 18th century staircase between the first and second floors in the main foyer, or moving about the lower rooms, tending to the spirits of the sick and dying. But these ghosts haven't found the fame of the casket girls, who have been immortalized in musicals, fiction, 
and even a modern gothic vampire ballet staged a few years back in Indiana. But what we have no record of is any of the early New Orleans thinking that the young women who arrived in 1728 were vampires. Commentary that the women were pill is understandable. After all, they had been stuck inside of a ship for six months and probably saw little to no sun as they had been put below deck as was proper for young virtuous women. The French Creoles living in New Orleans would also have been quite tan, situated near the Gulf as it is. New Orleans is a subtropical climate. In comparison to the sun-kissed skin of the Frenchmen, no doubt the casket girls would have looked nearly transparent. And it's great to imagine the Pope blessing 800 screws twice. We don't even know that. Blessing the nails to keep the vampires locked inside of the attic space will... It's a highly unlikely, or to keep something out. Was it really Anne Rice's take on it that sparked the whole thing? Is it simply the fact that New Orleans loved the alternative and weird, especially when it is intrinsically connected with their beloved history? Perhaps it's simply a case that the legend is retold and retold again because tourists love it. They love hearing it. What we do know is that the casket girls went on to make some brilliant marriages in their initial years in the French Quarter. And it's said that almost all of New Orleans can trace their lineage back to one of the young women sent from France to become the French Creole's brides. Another myth, perhaps? I don't know. But I do know that New Orleans is steeped in history and mystery, and there's no better way to explore it than a walking tour. Ghost tours are especially popular, as they offer a unique opportunity to learn about the city's dark past. Many of the buildings in New Orleans are said to be haunted, and the ghost stories that surround them are truly fascinating. So to put it all in a nutshell, in the 1700s, the French territories in Louisiana had a shortage of women. To solve this problem, the French arranged for the transport of appropriate women to be sent over to be married off to the local men. The first group of women were shipped off to Mobile in 1704 aboard the merchant ship Pelican. Therefore, Mobile affectionately refers to their Fiala cassettes as the Pelican Girls. A number of these women moved to New Orleans as part of a migration to the larger city over time. The second consignment of marriageable women arrived in Biloxi in 1719, followed by a third in New Orleans starting around in 1728, the Casket Girls. New Orleans was about 10 years old at the time. The name of the group of women kind of like the telephone game turned into something a little more sinister for a good legend and dark history, because we know that New Orleans has a dark history, and I'm here for it. Like many fascinating women throughout time, the Casket Girls made their mark on history. It is believed that these young women left a lasting footprint on the original colony of Louisiana. The Casket Girls ushered in the era of colonialism, reshaping the New World. And I myself am obsessed with history and a good vampire legend, even if that part is this, that, just a legend. Just what really resides behind those third floor nailed up shutters? Are you brave enough to see? Thank you all for joining me in this episode of uh, The Casket Girls. I really, really liked it. Uh, so interesting. Go and do your own research. Like I always say, go and research it. And I hope you guys join me next time on Tales Told in the Dark. Thank you. Thank you.